Okay, we are going for the first integration testing. I have the minimum configuration connected here. The oscilloscope is connected to the 12 volt line. So I immediately see whether the level is okay. It's, it's DC coupled right now. So let's turn this thing on and see what we get. But before we get to that, we need to start by removing the DRAMs and testing them. And for that I'm going to use these specialized chip pullers. They look like dentist equipment, but they are chip pullers. And they are required when the chip sort of sinks into the socket, like you're seeing there. I'm going to use this one, like a dentist's uh, pick. Um, and it's the only way to remove uh, chips from these sockets safely. You see they, they are really embedded in the socket so you need to use this and some lever action to lift them out safely. I'll, I'm going to test them uh, one by one with a chip tester uh, by a guy in the UK. He has an eBay shop called uh, the Analog Kid I think is the name. It's a very useful chip tester. That's what it looks like. It's for testing one bit DRAMs. It also tests uh, retention time, which many other testers don't do. I had a little problem with this tester. The button was not working at first, but a little deoxid uh, solved the problem and I'm quite happy with them. You press the button and it will make a number of tests. The LEDs blink and if at the end they are all blue, then the chip passes. And in this case, the chip passed the first TI chip. There are TI chips. Um, and sharp chips on this board. The TI ones have that little gray badge on top. It was looking promising, the second one tested okay as well, but from the third one onwards <laughs> it was a disaster for the TI chips. You see this one tested bad, red. I even took my camera to give you a close-up of this test. You press it, let's flick, and then immediately a red before even the test is complete. Uh, so this is a bad chip, and most of these TI chips uh, will be bad. I tested each one of them uh, one by one. I mark the bad chips and I put them on the top of the screen for you, and you will see how they will accumulate there. I'm replacing them with new old stock Mostec chips, a bad brand. It's the only ones I have, at least they are new old stock. I had eight of them. And as you will see, I consume them very quickly. That's the third one going in, and the fourth one going in, and the fifth. Very quickly, I used all eight uh, uh, replacement chips I had. But I continued testing. I just left you know, an empty socket behind, as you can see there. I continued testing them. They were still bad, so I left the sockets empty. I'll tell you in a moment uh, how I will go about this. And now I started testing the Sharp branded chips and not a single one of them is bad. Of the 16 TI chips, 12 were bad and of the 8 Sharp uh, chips, not one was bad. I marked them with a check mark. Very impressed with the quality of the, TI chi of the Sharp chips, but these are from TI and a whole 12 of them were bad. Unbelievable, something must have happened to this board. On the other hand, the sharp chips were not affected, so this is a matter of the quality of the chips. The sharp ones are much better. So since I don't have other replacement chips at hand right now, for the moment I decided that I would make two RAM banks complete. Banks 1 and 2 uh, uh, would be complete. I would move eight of my replacement chips, uh, new old stock, to bank 2. Bank 1 is the sharp chips, it's complete. And then I would have four still good TI chips on bank three, but not being used, just as reserve chips. And to make sure that the computer would be working this way, I had to change some of, of the shunts there that configure the computer for 36K or 32K of DRAM and 4K of video SRAM. Um, and then I will figure out how I will go about uh, the missing chips later. But that, that's what we have now. Two complete banks being used. The third bank is not being used. The four chips you see there are just reserves. And this is the configuration of the two, two shunts. Uh, uh, um, there are two places for these shunts. Uh, this is the second place. That's the configuration for 36 kilobytes. So if nothing else is wrong, the machine should work uh, this way, and then later on I will reconfigure it back to 48k. 
now we are ready to start reassembly for, for integration test. Um, I start by putting the hinge back um, at the back of uh, the bottom of the case. This computer is much like the Commodore PET in the sense that you can, you can lift the top of the case as if it were a car boot and it has a hinge for that. And this, this other part uh, is also like a car booth to, to keep the top of, of the case open while you examine uh, the interior. The right moment to put them back is now. Now I'm going to um, put the feet back. I have treated the four rubber feet and the four standoffs for the motherboard. I have treated them in 303 um, uh, protectant, uh, which hydrates uh, the plastics, uh, makes them less brittle uh, than they were. So I let I let them sort of soak in 303 for a while, and then I have to had to wipe them afterwards. Uh, I will be reusing these parts because they're still good. There's no reason to replace them. You have to put the feet back from underneath the case uh, and then you have to put a little pin in the middle so they stay in place. That's what I just did. And now the motherboard uh, standoffs. There are six of them. You can put a screw as well to hold the motherboard uh, firmly on them. For now I will just keep the standoffs in place. And now there comes the power supply, uh, exhaustively restored <laughs> in previous episodes. The right way to assemble it is not to start with these two screws that I'm putting now. <laughs> they should be the last ones to go in. Uh, do what I say, not what I did. Um, you have to put the four screws from the bottom of the case. They are much stronger. You have to put them first to hold all the mechanical stress. So that's what I'm still doing. I'm putting the four screws back. They are actually screws, not bolts. You don't need to put a nut on the other side. And that's the final one going in. So now the power supply is secure in place. And I shift my attention to cleaning the CRT. It accumulates soot over time, you know, and, 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 and dust because of the st static charge on the anode. So I'm cleaning all that. Um, out. It's the chance to do this. Once it goes back into the closed case, you know, when is this <laughs> going to happen again? And, and although nobody will see it once the case is completely assembled, well, I know. <laughs> and I will know if it's dirty and looking unseemingly. So that's why I'm doing this. A little deoxid uh, on the connectors at the back um, of the neck. A little deoxid, deoxid also on the anode connector, so you don't get sparks there and bad contact. I'm blowing off, blowing off dust from everywhere and deoxying uh, the yoke connector that goes to the analog board. Now, of course, uh, a little uh, window cleaner uh, to, to clean the face um, of the CRT. It doesn't have a safety screen. Uh, it does. It's an acrylic plate that goes afterwards on top of, of the front of the case. Uh, so I was a little bit iffy, but uh, <laughs> it should be safe. Uh, these are the components of the CRT cage. It's basically mechanical uh, components to hold everything in place. Uh, I didn't respray them because they are inside the case. They are not visible and they were not corroded. Um, but I do give them a clean. One of them holds the speaker, the, the, the built-in speaker of this computer. So that's the opportunity to give them a, a good wipe down. Also with window cleaner, which doesn't leave any residues behind. Now it's the time to begin reassembly. Uh, you have those two side supports. It's two screws for each. It's pretty simple. I'm showing you the whole process in case one day you find yourself having to restore uh, MZ80K. At least you have a reference of how things uh, come back together. So that's the other side support with the speaker. And there goes, there goes the CRT. And now we have to put the front bezel, which is part of the mechanical construct. You cannot assemble this without the front bezel. It's not purely decorative. It has a mechanical function uh, as well. You, have, you, you might have to massage <laughs> everything so everything lines up again, especially after respraying the thing, you know, contracts and expands and changes shape. So now we have it. Uh, the CRT cage is complete. 
everything is back in place, everything is clean, lubricated, resprayed, uh, and it's time now to put the analog video board back, which has also been exhaustively restored before, as you've seen in previous episodes. In it goes, it's held in place with four small screws, two per side. It hangs down the CRT cage, um, so you have to keep it sideways, not to put any stress uh, on the PCB. I'm reconnecting everything, including the, the connector that goes to the, to the neck of the CRT, but I'll give it another wipe down with a deoxid on the anode cap as well, just to make sure. There it goes, it's now it's back in. Uh, I made photos of everything, so I used the photos to make sure that uh, everything lines up as it was, including the connector at the back of the CRT that you see me putting in now, and the yoke connector that you see there going into the PCB. I'm checking that everything is okay, I'm blowing off dust again, and now I'm cleaning the contacts of the speaker with deoxid. Um, those little connectors as well come from the main analog board, and in they go. Uh, you will not see me reconnecting the ground of the CRT. I forgot it while I was filming, but uh, afterwards I did remember it and I connected it back. It's very important to reconnect the ground of the CRT. Really, really important for safety reasons as well. So now we are good to start reassembling the minimum configuration. That's what you see there. The, the CRT is back, the keyboard is back power supply is back, and the motherboard uh, is back. I connected the 12 volt line to my oscilloscope. There it is, uh, uh, the 12 volt lines, that's the red wire. So when I turn it on, I can see both the DC level uh, and the noise. So let's turn it on now. And let's see what comes up. And we have an image. <laughs> we have a solid, self-consistent image with garbon on the screen, not even characters, just some blocks and lines. Obviously there is still something wrong uh, with the analog board, with the, the digital board. Um, maybe even something, some, some cut traces that I forgot to, to redo, that I didn't see because of the, all the modifications that were there. For now I'm testing the controls of, of the display and they are working, that's horizontal hold, I can move the image horizontally, or in this case <laughs> vertically. Uh, that's the vertical hold, also working just fine. Focus, you, you will not see uh, on this image, the camera doesn't capture it, but there was a, a subtle change in focus. That's brightness, there's an obvious change there, so and that's working as well. Um, that's contrast, hard to see, but it does have an effect. I also played with volume, but nothing's producing sound right now, so that was useless. The monitor is working fine, the image is sharp, there is no burn-in, I'm quite happy with it. That's the 12 volt line, if I lower the zero level, uh, we can count uh, the divisions, it's 12 volts per division, so 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, almost 12, 11.8 I would say, 11.75. That's fine, it's within tolerance, 5% uh, is the tolerance. Now I'm going to AC mode, centering it again, and let's have a look at the noise. So if I zoom in to 50 millivolts per division, we should be able to see the noise in the 12 volt line. And you see a beating interference there, that's probably from the vertical refresh uh, uh, of the monitor. But it's within 50 millivolts, peak to peak, so that's pretty okay. Now let's look at uh, the switching noise itself, which is those moments of switch that you see there. I'm going to try to freeze one of them so we can look more carefully. Let's see, not yet, there we go. And then you see that it's well within 50 millivolts peak to peak and that's what I like to see. So that's pretty good, the power supply is working just fine. Let's move now to the 5 volt line and do the same checks again. This is on the real load, so this is the real test. And again, the switching noise is well within, well, it's within 50 millivolts peak to peak, which is what I like to see. There is no beat interference in this case. The 5 volt line doesn't go to the monitor, it stays uh, in the motherboard, the main digital board. Let's look now in DC coupling at the actual uh, DC level. 
I'm lowering the zero point and now we have to zoom out to one vote per division. There we go. So if you count the divisions now, you see that it's almost at five votes, a little lower as well, which is healthy. It's if, So long as it's within uh, the, the, the tolerances, it's healthy to have a little less voltage uh, than nominal applied. The, the chips will live longer like this, but it ha you have to be within the plus minus 5% tolerance. Now, if you remember the last episode when I tested the power supply, the 12 volt line was struggling. It was at 11.4, as you see there. Um, and I noticed afterwards that I didn't load the 5 volt line at all. Um, and that's significant because some of these switching power supplies, they don't like uh, unbalanced loads. That might have been the reason I was uh, having a bad result uh, last time. So, okay, now we are done with testing it with the oscilloscope. Let's test the same thing again with the multimeter and compare to the tests of the previous episode. I just showed you what the, what the results were. Now the load is balanced. I'm loading both the 12 volt line and the 5 volt line, the two switching uh, uh, lines. So let's see what we get now. It should be much better. Yes, 11.774. So it's well within the tolerance. Uh, you see the power supply works fine when it's loaded in a balanced way. That was the reason for the problems last time. Even the 5 volt line is looking better. 4.85, well within tolerances. That was the problem. I forgot to balance the load uh, in the previous test. The minus 5 volt line is, a, is linearly regulated, it's independent of the other two. It was good last time, it's good now, <laughs> because the linear regulators uh, uh, will, will regulate even without proper load. So it's good news overall, the power supply is fine, I don't need to recalibrate it. Having a lower voltage uh, than nominal is healthy for the chip, so long as you, so long as you are within 5% margin. The monitor is working fully, the power supply is working fully. Uh, and the motherboard is working to the point that it generates a coherent and consistent video image. We now, over the next episodes, have to go in and debug the digital circuit. But that's my home territory, so I'm looking forward to that. So join me in the next episodes when we will go in the, in the adventure of trying to troubleshoot uh, this 1978 board. I will see you then. Till then, take care.